Hello, and welcome to our National Girls Collaborative Project webinar, Addressing STEM Stereotypes with Young Children. I'm really excited to be here with a great group of speakers and attendees, and I hope you all enjoy this presentation. A quick word of housekeeping, we ask you to keep yourselves muted, but to be active and involved in the chat for asking questions, chatting, and sharing resources, as well as general networking and collaborating with one another. If you need any help with getting auto transcriptions up on your screen, please message Nancy Skills Coddington and she will help you figure out how to do that, but it is available to you. And we are going to have a formal question and answer portion towards the end of our webinar today, rather than stopping in between each of the presenters. We have a big group here today, and I'm really excited about that. I think some people are joining this as one of their first National Girls Collaborative Project events. So we wanted to kick off with just a little bit of background on who we are at NGCP, what our vision is, and share with you some resources that are related to the topic today that you might find useful and interesting. So what you see on screen here is our vision. NGCP is a national network of diverse stakeholders, and we're committed to advancing the agenda in gender equity. And how we do this is we bring together organizations that are committed to informing and encouraging girls to consider STEM. We're a network of networks and our reach is really quite broad. Um, we serve around 20 million girls through the programs in our network. And because many of our programs also serve boys, that means we're serving around 12 million boys as well. NGCP has been transforming STEM for 20 years. It's, this is actually a really exciting year for us because it's our 20th anniversary year of NGCP. And our vision, you know, to put it quite simply, is to create STEM experiences that are diverse and reflective of the world that we live in. We have three essential goals that you see on screen here, building and sustaining a network, catalyzing equity in STEM, and inc increasing our collective impact. And let me unpack that a little bit. We believe that STEM skills can be acquired by anyone and fostered in everyone. So our initiatives aim to build confidence and create a community of lifelong STEM activators. Through the power of collaboration, we spark curiosity and develop a passion for STEM. And we aim to share resources and solution, solutions with a coalition of leaders. Via our, and through our website, newsletters, online databases, social media, and of course, webinars like this one. We strengthen the capacity of programs by sharing exemplary practices, research, and program models. And we believe that when programs are stronger and more sustainable, girls and youth are better served. And finally, we leverage our network of girls serving STEM programs, active, advocates, excuse me, and youth, so that together we can create the tipping point for gender equity in STEM. We are doing a lot here at NGCP. We have a lot of activities, programs, things that are going on, both virtually and nationally and through our local collaboratives. And I just want to, you know, quickly share about a few that might be interesting or useful to you. So we partner with organizations to scale and deliver content, such as the Leap into Science National Network, which is in partnership with the Franklin Institute, as well as the Million Girl Moonshot, which is in partnership with STEM Next and the Mott After School State Networks, serving hundreds of educators via local networks. Working with Lida Hill Philanthropies, NGCP match, manages the If Then collection, and we'll be popping some of these resources in the chat for you um, as I share about them. The If Then collection is a digital library housing photos, videos, and other media of women in STEM fields. And this media is all available for you to use at no cost. So it's a great free resource for you to use in the classroom, at home, and in formal learning settings. We host an, an amazing youth advisory board. Our youth advisory board helps to review and provide feedback on our National Girls Collaborative Project initiatives. And they really assist in helping to form the future direction of NGCP and what, we're, what we aim to do with our future work. Fab Femmes is another great international database of female role models from many STEM fields. 
these role models are passionate about what they do. So if you're looking to try to get a female STEM role model to connect with your programs virtually or in person in your area, please do check out that Fab Femmes database that Nancy is sharing in the chat. And finally, we also have state collaborative leadership teams locally that offer convenings, provide professional developments, mini grants for innovative projects when funding is available, and they also distribute their own newsletters, they do their own webinars, spotlighting local resources. I probably don't need to tell you much about our national webinars. You're here. You found us. I'm thrilled about that. Um, but we offer them monthly on topics that help our networks grow and thrive. We have all sorts of different speakers that come every month. And you can find all of our um, webinars that we're offering through December on our events and announcements page. If you haven't already signed up for our NGCP newsletter, um, Nancy's going to pop that link in the chat as well. You really don't want to miss our newsletter. This is where you're going to get a lot of great resources, tips, um, links, where you'll hear about our events, um, and you'll be the first to know. Whew, that was a mouthful, um, but I really wanted to share that with you all and get, let you get to know NGCP and what we do a little bit more. But now this is the topic. This is the reason why we're all here today. Hopefully, unless you clicked this link incorrectly, you're here to talk about addressing STEM stereotypes. And you might not know, you might know that this is part two of a two-part webinar series. If you did join us last week, feel free to pop in the chat. Let us know um, what your key takeaways were. We can try to share with you in the chat a link to last week's recording. Last week, we talked about addressing STEM stereotypes with youth and young adults. And this week, we're talking about young children. And we're really going to hit this third bullet point that you see on screen. When do stereotypes begin to impact children and youth? And we have speakers that are going to talk about the preschool level and the elementary school level as well in this webinar. And I really hope that you come away with some strategies and approaches after today's webinar for how you can really go about addressing STEM stereotypes with the youth that you serve directly or indirectly, or if you're a parent or caregiver, how you can be doing it in your home as well. I'd like to ask you to share in the chat what are your experiences with STEM stereotypes? We talked about this last week and the chat was really vibrant with people sharing their own personal experiences with STEM stereotypes and how it impacted them personally, memories from when they were a kid, how it impacts the youth that you serve. So as we start talking about stereotypes, please share in the chat if you feel comfortable your experiences around stereotypes. I'm kind of inspired by what people shared last week. So I wanted to share my own take and why this is important to me. I actually have vivid memories being a young girl, hearing things like, your brother is better at math because he's a boy from well-meaning caregivers who meant this in more of like a comforting way. And that has stuck with me. That has really stuck with me my whole life through college, that nervousness, that lack of confidence. It really impacted my STEM identity, maybe more than anything else, including the lack of female role models, including everything else that I also experienced growing up. And that early experience with this stereotype that girls are not good at math and science, that boys are better at it and it's okay because I'm better at other things, really propelled me into my work throughout my PhD, exploring STEM stereotypes, exploring how they begin early and exploring the lasting consequences, if you will, of those early experiences with these stereotypes. And so all of that is discussed in my book, Breaking the STEM Stereotype, Reaching Girls in Early Childhood, which we'll share in the chat if this is something that you're interested in or that you want to read a little bit more about after this presentation, but I see a lot of people are sharing some great things and personal stories in the chat. So thank you for sharing actively there. But what I'm thrilled about, um, and it's kind of starts us off on a negative tone to talk about these stereotypes. What I'm excited about are people like our three speakers here today who aren't saying, yeah, this, this, is, this isn't great, this is terrible. They're saying, here's what we can do about it. And these three speakers want you to leave today with strategies and understanding of research and practice that will help you 
change that um, and hopefully prevent or counter stereotypes that young children are still continuing to be exposed to things like what I grew up hearing um, still today. So I wanna say a huge thank you to our speakers and give a brief introduction about each of them. Dr. Allison Master is an assistant professor in the University of Houston College of Education and the director of the Identity and Academic Motivation Lab. She holds a PhD in developmental psychology from Stanford University. Her research has been funded by the National Science Foundation and the US Department of Education's Institute for Education Sciences with publications in Science, Child Development, the Journal of Educational Psychology and Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Her research examines how stereotypes impact girls' interests and sense of belonging in STEM, especially computer science and engineering. And I'm thrilled that she's gonna be sharing a little bit of her research with all of us here today. Next, I want to um, introduce Kim Colazzo, an educator who I truly have admired for a really long time. She's a 30-year educator and an NC State Keenan Fellow. She has presented on STEM in elementary classrooms, closing the gender gap in elementary STEM, and integrating STEM and literacy. Besides her classroom work, she has been an elementary STEM lab teacher, a district digital integration facilitator, and a published STEM picture book author. And I have to tell you, her Emerson Blake picture book is one of my own kids' favorite STEM picture book with a female protagonist. You know we need more of those out there. So I have to ask Nancy to put that link in the chat to Kim's author page because you won't want to miss some of her wonderful books. And last but absolutely not least, we have Carmelo Piazza, also known as Carmelo the Science Fellow. So maybe that's what we should be calling you in the chat when we chat with you today. He has been teaching science to Brooklyn children for over two decades. He holds a master's degree in elementary science and environmental education from Brooklyn College and did graduate studies in speech language pathology at Long Island University. Carmelo is the author of Crazy for Science with Carmelo the Science Fellow, a book of at-home experiments that promote scientific observation, exploration, and analysis for young children. He hosts a popular series of YouTube experiments, and he has four kids of his own, ranging from age 15 to 1. In 2013, Carmelo achieved his dream of opening a preschool where he can teach science on his own terms a place where little kids are considered little scientists. The first location of the Brooklyn Preschool of Science opened in Cobble Hill. The park's lo location opened two years later, and now there is a third location in Brooklyn Heights. And everything that I read about the Brooklyn Preschool of Science makes me wish I could pack up my little family, move to Brooklyn so they could attend the Brooklyn Preschool of Science and, and learn with Carmelo the Science Fellow. Well, I wanna thank all three of you for being here today. And I'm thrilled that you'll get a chance to hear from each one of them. The first person that you'll be hearing from today is Dr. Allison Master. So I'm going to turn it over to Allison now. Hi, uh, thanks so much for having me here. I really appreciate NGCP and Amanda for inviting me. And I'm very much looking forward to going and reading all of your books right after this. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about some of our research on why and how to counter STEM stereotypes for young children. Next slide, please. So this is Chimamanda Adichie. She's a Nigerian author and novelist, and she gave a really wonderful TED talk a few years ago about stereotypes, which are these beliefs that link groups with certain traits, like this belief that men are better than women in math and science. And so I want to share with you her take on stereotypes. Click, please. Thank you. So she talked about the danger that happens when our society only tells one story about something. And ne next click. All right, so she said the single story creates stereotypes, and the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but that they're incomplete. So they make one story become the only story. So today we're going to be talking about these STEM stereotypes, and I want us to talk about what happens when the only story that young girls hear is that STEM is not for them. And I want to share with you some of the research that my colleagues and I have done on how we can try to rewrite that story by broadening some of these stereotypes about who's interested in STEM. Next slide. So in my research, we focused on these gender stereotypes in particular and how this belief that STEM is for boys can make young girls feel like they won't belong in STEM. 
Next slide. So when girls feel like they won't belong or can't succeed in STEM, they're not interested in trying it and they choose to take other classes or other after school programs or summer camps. Next slide. And these stereotypes matter because they create self-fulfilling prophecies that push girls away from STEM. So we've done several experimental studies where we look at whether these stereotypes can cause girls to become less interested in STEM activities like computer science, and the answer is yes. So every single time we do these studies, we find that girls are much less interested in STEM activities when we remind them of these stereotypes. So in one study, we told eight and nine-year-old girls about two new computer science activities that they could try. And we assigned one a stereotype. So we told kids, girls are much less interested than boys in this activity. And for the other activity, it wasn't stereotyped. So we told them, girls and boys are equally interested in this activity. Next slide. And the girls in our study were much less interested when the activity was stereotyped. So I want to show you an example that shows you how most of the girls in our study responded. Play video. I'm not hearing the sound. Well, you shared the screen. Did you press share audio at the bottom? Let me try to do that again. Just a moment. So are you interested in doing the searching activity today? The one that girls are much less interested in than boys are? Yes or no? No, I want to do the other one. Okay. So, and so we found that 65% of girls chose to avoid the stereotyped activity and do the non-stereotyped activity instead. And we ran another study with middle school girls and we gave them this same kind of stereotyped or non-stereotyped information about computer science classes that they could take. And click please. And we found that older girls show this exact same pattern as well, that girls were much less interested in taking a computer science class when it was linked to the stereotype that girls were less interested in than boys. And that time we found that 80% of girls preferred to take the other non-stereotyped class. And in both of these studies, we found that the stereotype didn't matter at all for boys, just for girls. And we know exactly why girls were less interested, because when they heard about these stereotypes, they told us that it made them feel like they wouldn't belong or they wouldn't be good at that activity or in that class. And the more that they felt that way, the less interested they were in trying the activity or signing up for that class. And then the next thing about STEM stereotypes that I want you to know is how early kids start to believe in these stereotypes. So this graph is going to show you data from a study with more than 1500 students that shows you how much students in grades one through 12 believe in these stereotypes that boys are more interested than girls in STEM. So I'm going to show you computer science in the black line and engineering is going to be the green line. And you can see it's broken down by grade level going across the graph. And so positive values are going to represent stereotypes that favor boys. So that's going to be anything in that blue zone. And then negative values represent stereotypes that favor girls. So anything in that purple zone at the bottom. And so what you can see from computer science is that already by third grade, children believe that boys are more interested than girls in computer science. And this belief just gets stronger and stronger over time, especially once students get to middle school and to high school. And then, yeah, thank you. And the data for engineering is even more striking. So children already believe these stereotypes about engineering by first grade. Next slide, thank you. So something else I really wanna bring your attention to is that we often talk about STEM like it's this one thing, but really different STEM fields can be really different from each other. And even elementary school children have different stereotypes about different STEM fields. So click please. So just like we saw on the last slide, for engineering, children already have very strong stereotypes favoring boys as early as first grade. And next, so for, but for computer science, they still have these stereotypes favoring boys, but they come out a little bit later around third grade. And next, um, but when we ask kids about science, children don't really have strong gender stereotypes about science yet. And next, and when we ask them about math, actually children either don't have gender stereotypes or maybe say that math is for girls. So when we think about children in STEM, we should pay some special attention to things like engineering and computer science, 
because these are fields that children typically don't have much experience with, except that they figure out pretty early on that these are activities for boys. Next slide. But across all of these STEM fields, we find that the more that girls believe in these stereotypes that favor boys, the less motivated they are in STEM in terms of being interested and confident and feeling like they belong there. And so that's why it's so important to give children these positive early experiences so we can help to counter those stereotypes as early as possible before the stereotypes start to take root in students' minds. And next slide. So something else that I think is particularly useful for educators to know is that we found that these stereotypes about being interested in STEM were the strongest negative predictor of girls' own motivation. So even more than their stereotypes about ability. And kids were even more likely to believe in these stereotypes that boys are more interested than girls compared to the, one, to the stereotypes about ability. So I think it's especially important for us to think about the ways that we send this message to girls that we expect them to not be interested in STEM. You know, through the birthday presents that we buy them and the summer camps we sign them up for, um, the STEM characters in the books we read to them, and even, you know, whether or not their clothes have cool STEM things on them. So it's really important to build girls' confidence, but it's also really important that girls think that STEM is fun for girls. Next slide. So when I talk about this research, a question that I get a lot is, well, what if the stereotypes are true? And there's a few points that I want to make. Um, Please, please, thank you. So first, the first and very most important one is that gender differences in STEM interests haven't shown up yet for young children. So these gender gaps in STEM interests start to show up in later elementary school or middle school. And next, thank you. We should never let these stereotypes limit the opportunities that we give to children. So when we make assumptions about what we think they're going to like or not like, we may unintentionally perpetuate these stereotypes. So we never want to let these stereotypes limit what children get to experience or what they believe they're capable of. And then finally, even if these stereotypes might be true on average for adults or for certain groups, they can be very harmful when we apply them to individuals and when we apply them to children because they reinforce that dangerous single story. Next slide. All right, so how do we counter these stereotypes? So I have some research-based suggestions for you and I'm also really excited to hear uh, more ideas from the other panelists today. Um, so the first thing to do is just challenge stereotypes with children when you hear them. So when you hear children or adults repeating stereotypes, ask them more questions like, do you think that's fair? Why can't girls be scientists? Because fairness is, is an issue that young children understand very, very well. So you can offer counterexamples from your own experiences or point out similarities between girls and boys in your program. And second is to provide relatable role models, especially ones who are similar to your students and especially if they've overcome obstacles to be successful. And I think something that's really important to note is that effective role models don't have to be women for girls. Uh, Dr. Colleen Lewis is a computer science professor um, and she sent me this picture and she told me this story from when she was doing a program with middle school students um, and teaching them coding. And every week she would show them different computer science role models. And the girl's favorite role model, the one who got the most excited about programming was this guy, Rob, who was an animator for DreamWorks Animation and helped to um, animate um, the movie Kung Fu Panda. And the kids just thought that was such a cool and fun way to use programming. So we wanna use these role models to tell more stories about who does STEM so that we can move away from that dangerous single story that STEM is only for this one kind of person. And next is to teach growth mindsets to your students. And the, because the fear of making mistakes can make girls feel intimidated or not confident in STEM, especially as they get a little bit older. So you wanna help them build that growth mindset and to realize that everyone gets better at STEM with effort and help and the right strategies. And that it's okay to be not perfect and to make mistakes because that's part of the scientific process and that's how we learn. It's not a sign that you don't belong. And you can help to model this mindset for them when you make mistakes. And then fourth is to think before you speak, because the way that we talk about girls and women can affect the way that girls view themselves. So for example, saying something like, girls are just as good as boys can actually make children think that maybe the opposite is true, because otherwise, why would you even need to say that? Or doing things like using gender to divide students up can reinforce the idea that girls and boys are fundamentally different. Next slide. 
All right. So uh, thank you so much for, um, for listening. And if you're interested in learning more about our research, please visit our website or follow me on Twitter. And I have a QR code here that's going to take you straight to our most recent paper, which is open access so everyone can read it and learn more about our research. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Master. It was so great to hear the research. Um, because I think it provides such a wonderful foundation for what I would like to share with you. My name is Kim Colazzo, and um, I have been an educator in public education for over 30 years as a digital integration facilitator most recently, um, but most of my time was spent in the classroom. Five of the last years have been spent in uh, an elementary STEM lab. And so I want to share a little bit with you about what we are doing at the elementary level um, in our schools. I work in North Carolina, and so let's um, jump ahead and, and I'll share some of the things that we've been doing. So um, just like Dr. Master was sharing with you, um, we wanted to focus a little bit more on our girls because we were often seeing that even though our girls were interested in the engineering strands that we do at our elementary level, um, once they moved into middle school and high school, they weren't signing up for the CTE courses. They weren't signing up for the STEM related courses in high school. And as we have begun to focus on um, empowering our girls a little bit more from preschool on through our elementary years and our elementary program, we are seeing that start to turn around and a lot more of our girls enter those um, classes and become part of the robotics teams and the cybersecurity teams that we have at the upper levels. Um, our girls often didn't see a connection between what they were learning and what did they what they wanted to pursue in their career. So even if they had a STEM interest early on, they weren't seeing the connection between what was going on traditionally in the classroom with what they would really like to do. And then finally, exposing our students to the role models that um, will give them some representation and, and show that, yes, there are girls around the world doing the same things they're interested in. Next slide. And so some ways that we've been in, um, addressing these issues, and it goes right along with the research that was just shared, um, making sure our girls acknowledge the struggle and acknowledge um, you know, that there is power in failure and that everyone fails. All of our students from preschool on up in our district um, work with the engineering design process. They learn the steps of um, you know, asking questions, imagining, planning, creating a solution, um, testing it out, retesting. Um, we also want to watch what they watch. And this is true um, for things that they see not only at home, but for videos maybe that we show in the classroom. Are there stereotypes conveyed through those videos? And you know, making sure that we address those as we're having discussions with our students in the classroom with not only our girls, but our boys as well. Um, making sure that we promote multidimensional interests. So letting our girls know that it's okay to be very interested in um, what was traditionally seen as a girl sport, such as cheerleading. Um, they can also have an interest in science at the same time. They do not have to be one dimensional. All of those interests can um, come together to make up who they are and what they wanna do in their future. And then of course, providing those great role models um, that Dr. Master talked about as well. On the next slide, um, I wanted to share just a few other things. A lot of our teachers um, ask, well, how can we start integrating STEM? How can we get our girls interested? And the number one thing that we always point out is, is starting with a picture book. And so that is the reason that I wrote Emerson Blake um, and that we use a lot of picture books that have girl protagonists uh, so that our girls see that they can be the explorers, they can be the engineers, they can be the inventors and the scientists. Um, and so starting that integration with picture books, starting young, like I said, all of our programs, all of our uh, elementary schools that have preschools, we start the engineering process and the STEM related um, activities at that age. Our, even our preschoolers are learning to code and to build and to create. Um, allowing for creativity. A lot of times people think of STEM as, um, you know, giving a model for what you're, you want your students to build and then having them build that exact same thing. But we truly believe in, you know, having our students run through the engineering design process where it allows for their creativity and choice. Finding out what our students are interested in. If, they're, if our girls are interested in um, more arts and crafts type things, building those into our STEM challenges. If they are interested in animals and pets and things like that, 
building some challenges in or some picture books in that relate to those interests. Um, if they have an interest in photography or like my granddaughter there in the bottom picture, if they have an interest in being outdoors all the time and holding frogs and, and all those really cool outdoor environmental things, building in some environmental challenges um, so that they can see that those passions and interests that they have um, can play a role in the way they solve problems in school and then later on maybe in a career. And so I just wanted to share on the next slide um, just a few of the things that that we've done in our in the STEM lab. If you're interested in any of these or would like to hear about more of them, please feel free to contact me. My information will be in the slides. Um, but I did keep a website um, for the four years that I was a STEM lab teacher of all of the lessons that we did with our preschool up through our fifth through fifth grade classes um, with all of the lessons that we did every week. And I would be glad to share that with you. But here are just some of the favorites that I thought kind of went along with our topic today. So uh, starting with the picture book, When I Build with Blocks, um, just having our little preschoolers, um, you know, build things and then empowering them to share out what did they build? Did they have to redesign it? Um, down on the bottom picture with the bees, they were, we try to link with the curriculum that teacher classroom teachers are teaching so that, you know, um, they can see the connectedness between STEM and engineering and coding and the standards that are being taught in the elementary classroom. So this particular class was studying um, bees and pollination. And so we read the picture book, What If There Were No Bees? And because I knew this particular group of girls were very interested in arts and crafts, they always loved to color the things that we were engineering. Um, you know, gave them the choice to color some flowers. They put them out on a board and then they had to code their little bee bots, which are self-contained robots that they code just by pushing buttons on the top. So they were not only learning science, they were learning um, how to code their robot and in interweaving that um, arts and crafts and coloring artistic um, style that they really want, they, they really showed a passion for. Um, My Truck is Stuck was another lesson that we did. Uh, the picture right below that book um, is the one that goes with it. So it's about, it's a cute little picture book about um, a dump truck that gets stuck and all the friends come and they try to work out a solution on how to get it unstuck. And so after we read the picture book, the engineering teams had to um, use Dash Robot, which is by Wonder Workshop, and see if they could take uh, three matchbox cars that were broken and transport them using materials like pipe cleaners and strings and rubber bands, see if they could work out a way to transport their vehicle across to the other side of the room where the other half of their team um, was going to be the fix it shop. So just kind of building in STEM challenges where all of our students, not just our girls, but all of our students are feeling empowered to be engineers and solving problems related to a picture book. And then finally on this slide, um, we had noticed that a lot of our younger students could um, picture things in two dimensions, but they really had a hard time building things up in three dimensions. And they had been studying a little bit about geography and maps and the compass rows and things like that. And so we read the picture book, Henry's Map which is all about this pig that follows a map through throughout the farmyard. And then their engineering challenge was to see if they could make their own map using three dimensional objects. So they could draw on the map, but they also had to build with, um, you know, we just threw out Legos and Lincoln logs and all of those things that lots of classrooms have anyway, and allowing them to become engineers. And you can see how very young they were. Um, and, you know, just giving that uh, power to them to create. And then of course they had to share out and we did a gallery walk and everybody got to see each other's maps. So those are just some, some examples of what we have done in the lower grades in our elementary schools. On the next slide, I wanna to talk to you about something I'm really proud of. Um, this is a group that we started, Giga Girls After School Coding Club. Um, and we started it with third, fourth and fifth grade girls because we knew we had a lot of girls that as we saw them working through first and second grade, were very interested in the coding and things that we had done at those early ages. And so they were an after school group that met every Tuesday and did lots of different coding activities together for about an hour and a half. And then if we go to the next slide, you'll see that um, we were really, I really wanted them to have those role models and, and, and not only see those role models, but interact with role models. And so I contacted the computer science department at NC State University here in North Carolina. And I told them about what we were doing. And I 
um, formed a relationship with this wonderful, she was a sophomore at the time, computer science major, and she gathered all of her computer science major friends that were females at both NC State, UNC Chapel Hill, and she even had a friend out at Stanford who was interested in our project. And we matched our girls up with these role models in college who were studying the same things that they were interested in. And so our girls um, at the end of every session each week would blog about what they had learned. And our mentors at the university level would read the children, would read the girls' blogs and um, comment back to them. And so I just wanted to pull out a couple. I won't read the whole thing, but you can see a nom at the top of um, this particular blog post. She's the mentor that this was sent to. Um, and Kaden was one of our, she was a fourth grade girl at the time. And Kaden was so excited to get this response from Anam because Kaden had been doing some a project in Scratch and Anam responded that, hey, I'm programming a game in Scratch too at the university level. And Kaden was so excited that she was doing something that somebody at the university level was also doing. And so they had a great time chatting back and forth in the blog about their um, programming in Scratch. And then on the next slide, you will see that they also were able to chat with their mentors about difficulties they were having. You know, Kaden telling her here that she was having trouble with her code and had to work out the bugs. And Anam saying, you know what, I have bugs in my code too, and you have to work through it. And just the support and relationships that these um, young girls and women uh, had together was just so amazing. I get goosebumps even talking about it. On the next slide, you'll see that the first year we did it, um, we were able to Skype with the mentors and the men and, and our girls. So you can see how excited our girls were to Skype with their mentees, uh, their mentors at the university level. And you can see from the picture that um, not only does female representation matter, but color of skin and culture and ethnic background matters. And we, and, you know, our girls just felt so good that they were seeing women who were just like them doing things that they were passionate about as well. Um, we, they, the uh, mentors sent us little care packages with little gifts and cards and the girls were obviously so excited. I don't have pictures, but the following year we were actually able to go up to NC State and tour um, the computer science department. And um, they were able to interact face-to-face -face, uh, with their mentors and do some really fun coding activities. And they even played Duck Duck Goose out on the lawn just um, you know, to to bridge that gap and make those relationships and and see that, you know, this really is a future that I can have as a young girl. And so on the next slide, we took that one step further and we um, partnered up with a group called Level Up Village. And we wanted our girls to see that not only were there women and girls interested in our district, in our state, in our country, but also around the world, girls also interested in programming. And so we were met Okay, um, so uh, we were matched up with a school in Mexico and our girls um, were able to work on a scratch video game together. So on the next slide, you will see that um, they worked on their video game and they kept um, blogs with each other. Uh, they, they videoed, each other and when we look at each other's video blogs and then at the end they got to Skype so they were working together on a coding project so this was a great way to for to show our girls that it um, there are global role models as well that are their same age and then on the last slide I just wanted to share um, my connecting information with you. I would love to connect with you. My email is there, my website. Um, if you're interested in seeing my STEM websites where all of the lessons are shared and a lot of the slides are shared as well, I'm, uh, feel free to reach out. And I'm also very active on Twitter if you wanna see what we're doing in our labs now. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I hope to connect with you throughout the chat and after today. Thanks, Kim. Hi, everybody. Um... Welcome to Addressing STEM Stereotypes with Young Children. Um, a little bit about me. My name is, uh, next slide please. My name is Carmelo Piazza and I've been kind of like a staple uh, teaching science in downtown Brooklyn, my goodness, from 1997 up until today. Um, and it was sort of uh, all of a accidental discovery. Um, in 1997, I just graduated with my degree in elementary ed, young kid, super excited to start teaching, went on a fourth grade interview, 
And they said, sorry, you have no experience. And I literally went home and I cried. I really wanted this job. But what happened was the science teacher at the school decided to take the fourth grade position. And I got offered the science position. And they said, are you ready to teach science? And I said, but I don't have experience here like the fourth grade. But 1997, the acronym STEM and STEAM pretty much was non-existent, didn't exist. And I wanted the job. And I'm like, absolutely, I can do this. My first day. I realized that there were no materials in the classroom, no books, no lesson plans, no curriculum. And I was sort of at a loss. And then I just kind of just stopped. And I thought about these amazing science methodology classes that I took in the undergrad level and decided to start day one by doing something that's really beautiful, hands-on. And I made a bubbleology activity. And I'll never forget it. It was a group of fifth graders. And I'm teaching about cohesion and surface tension. And it was just so many beautiful connections. I go home. And I had no idea how my experience was. Very next day, a dad comes up to me and he's like, excuse me, can I speak to you? And I'm 22 and I'm extremely frightened. I'm like, oh, yeah, can I help you? He's like, are you Carmelo? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, last night, my daughter, Corey, who's never spoke about science in 10 years of her being, well, she's 10, in five years of her being there, never, ever spoke of science, has you one day for 45 minutes and goes home and says, dad, dad. I love science. And the dad goes, well, what are you talking about? Who is this new person? So she says, it's Carmelo. And the dad goes, well, it sounds like he's Carmelo the Science Fellow. And that's how the name Carmelo the Science Fellow came into existence. Um, I'm a father of four kids. More importantly, three of the four are my daughters, right? I have Amanda, Riley, and Cassidy. And I had a great opportunity to teach thousands and thousands of children in my lifetime. Um, next slide, please. And one thing that I realized is you know, oftentimes we wait until it's too late to lay these beautiful foundations for children. You know, for instance, the teaching of coding and robotics. There is no elementary school pretty much in Brooklyn in the public school sector that is yet laying these foundations in the K through five sector. But the reality is if you lay foundations, right, at the bottom floor, you don't do it on five and six. If we start when the child is two, three, four, five, and six. And if we look at kids through the lens of learners, and you don't look at them through this gender-based ideology, right? They're kids. And if you almost focus primarily on your curriculum and you focus more on these beautiful interdisciplinary connections, you're laying foundations from the very start, which breaks these stereotypes from the beginning because it's all an integrated approach, okay? Next slide, please. I wanna play a video because I feel like there's so much relevance here and, and hopefully the sound works, let's see. Does your preschooler have a green thumb? We can cultivate it. At the Brooklyn Preschool of Science, we bring botany into the classroom, offering hands-on fun, planting the seeds of environmental awareness, <laughs> lots of seeds, and watching them grow. Now enrolling. So that video to me is so special. The teacher of that room is one of the most amazing educators and her name is Miss Hayat. I had the pleasure of being Miss Hayat's teacher when she was five years old. She is now teaching my current five-year-olds. Um, and again, it, it just goes to show you that if you lay these beautiful foundations when a child is two, three, and four, and you have teachers, like it says here, that are just so confident and enthusiastic of establishing a love and STEM and STEAM. You create these passionate learners and they do take that through life. And, you know, it broke my heart in 2013. I left teaching the public school system. Um, I felt like I did my civic duties and I really wanted to open up a school where I could really focus on having my own autonomy and my own vision. And I leave 261 and I made a lot of children cry. It broke my heart. And my daughter Riley was going to 261. And about six months later, my daughter Riley's like, hey, dad, you know, I have a new science teacher and her name is Miss Khadija. And I say, and this is another person. And I'm like, well, Miss Khadija, he's like, Miss Khadija says you taught her. So I go pick up Riley and Riley said, I, and I meet Miss Khadija. And Miss Khadija's like, Carmelo, I don't know if you remember me, but you taught me when I was five years old. And you were my science teacher up and through sixth grade, you made me love 
hands-on learning. You made me love STEM and STEAM ideology that I just needed to become a science teacher. And these are just two beautiful examples. Ms. Hayat, who's currently working at my school, impacting on the lives of children because that foundation was set when she was five. Ms. Khadija, teaching at PS261, laying and teaching, I think there's maybe 900 children in that school, and she's creating a future love of learners. And again, if we just look at kids, okay, especially girls, right, and you just look at them as learners, and you don't focus about anything else other than that, you just create kids who want to go through life, you know, consistently pushing themselves forward. You know, if we could go to the next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Um, this is a really sad statistic, you know, that many classroom teachers aren't teaching science, right? When I was a science, they called us the science clusters, and I really, really disliked the term cluster because I was a specialist, right? My master's is in environmental science. But my children at PS261 had no science instruction. It was literacy block after math block, and the only science that these kids were receiving was from me, a science specialist. And the sad part is there are so many schools in New York City that do not have science specialists. And if they don't have a science specialist, now who is trying to lay these foundations and the love and appreciation in STEM and STEAM if there is nobody there teaching them, okay? And I'm gonna share a quick story. In 2000 and when was it? 1997, I started teaching. There was a little girl who had just come from France, right? I was her, I taught her in second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade. When they leave me, I don't really keep relationships with them. They go to middle school and high school. And one day I'm walking on Smith Street and I see a dad, really thick French accent. His name is Charles. And he stops me in the street and he's like, Carmelo, do you remember me? I'm like, oh my goodness, of course. How's your daughter doing? He goes, you know, you should be very proud. And I'm like, well, why? He's all, he goes, my daughter just was a top 10 finalist in the National Science Fair. Uh, it was like an event, a National Science Fair contest. And she made the top 10. And I'm like, whoa. Well, one, it shows a teacher who lays foundations creates a passionless learner. Two, she had a father who also continued that love of STEM at home. But then the kicker here is, I said, that is really, really amazing. He goes, but that's not why you should be proud. And I'm like, well, why should I be proud? He goes, you actually had two. He goes, do you remember her best friends? And I don't want to use any kids' names. I said, well, yeah, I remember her. They both, both girls may, were two of the 10 finalists were girls and two of those girls were kids that I taught when they were five and six and seven and eight and nine. And ultimately, again, you don't wait until sixth and seventh grade to lay these foundations. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, when you think about this, when I was teaching at the elementary school level, I really did have a beautiful impact. I was teaching kindergarten to grades five and for many years, grade six was at the school. But my wife was an educator. I opened up a couple of science centers for kids. I just felt this itch that I needed to have my own autonomy and I needed to have my own vision. And I felt like I needed to go younger because as we all know, you don't learn a language, whether it's Asian, Mandarin, excuse me, whether it's Mandarin, Chinese, whatever it might be, Italian, Spanish, it's so hard to acquire that language in middle and high school. So we decided to open up a school. Let's go to the bottom. Let's get them when they're two and three and four. And I'll tell you how sad it was. When I started my school in 2012, my fours classroom had 20 kids, 17 of the kids were boys, three were girls. I had parents actually telling me when they would come touring in the school, do you think that this is okay for my daughter? And I would turn around and just say to them, well, what does that mean? She's a child. What you need to worry about is just looking at her through that lens of being a kid. Let me worry about educating her. So with the next slide, you'll get a chance to see how if you create a curriculum where whether you were a boy or girl, okay, and obviously we're focus, focusing here more on breaking these gender stereotypes, but if you create units of study, if you create thematic units, if you create curriculum where reading, writing, math, art, movement, measuring, fine motor, and all of those domains are connected through this interdisciplinary learning, what you do is you start to lay these beautiful loves and appreciations. Kids have a chance to be learning in a loving way. And if you go to the next slide, I wanna show you how simple 
of a way it is, you know, because it's like you said, I think somebody said before, I don't know if it was Kim or Dr. Master about how some teachers maybe subconsciously are putting boys with boys and girls with girls. That just never happens here. You know, the key is focus on the units of study and look at how creative the teaching of math can be, the connection to the engineering, where right now, if you actually, right outside my school, there's a, a grocery store and there's four gigantic pallets of pumpkins. We bought a pumpkin for every child. Okay, boy, girl, doesn't matter. Two-year-old, three-year-old, again, doesn't matter. The key is asking kids beautiful questions. If you ask a child a question, it creates the act of wanting to do something, to problem solve. It taps into every child's innate curiosity. The key is to give all of these kids, primarily girls, these experiences when they're young. Because if I ask the question like, hey, everybody, does anybody know what is inside of that pumpkin? Every child innately just wants to look inside that pumpkin. Now imagine you as an educator facilitating that process. And these kids are ripping out the pulp and the rind and the seeds, right? And all of a sudden it's language, it's fine motor and sensory. Now, again, you don't just throw out this pumpkin and now just worry about art in a later activity. No, it's all about cross-cutting connections. It's all about you know, creating a love of learning and connecting these domains together because now you're going to take any child and show them that learning is amazing and fun. Now look, think about how easy it is. We made a pumpkin pit neural with the pumpkin. I could teach a math connection by sequencing the seeds or giving them one inch squares to measure the diameter. Or imagine you, you want to talk about technology and engineering. Imagine giving the kids a cup of flour and water and salt and pumpkin puree. And as they're rolling it and kneading it, we just made pumpkin clay. And if it's too wet, well, that's okay. Why was it too wet? What could we do differently? They are open-ended questions. And I think I, I kind of question why I needed to speak here today, but I realized that at the end of the day, the, the, the goal of a, an educator should be one goal, to lay early life experiences for all children. And if you focus on that goal of laying foundations with their two, three, and four, and providing them with early life experiences, you have done your job. Because if you go to the next slide, and I like using biodiversity as a great talking point. I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm born in Brooklyn. I don't think I'm ever leaving Brooklyn. What animal life was I exposed to? Nothing. There were birds. You can't catch them. There were squirrels. You couldn't touch them. So the minute that there was a, a water bug that would come out of that pipe in the sink, you would scream. Well, in my school, if we go to the next slide, please. And this is also true when I taught at PS261. I literally had 30 different animals in my building. Okay. In my school, I am not going to let the kids in Warwick County upstate have an opportunity to have an appreciation of the life sciences because they have schoolyard ecology that is so tangible. You open up the door, there's birds, bees, newts, salamanders, they see everything, but the kids in the city see nothing. So when I was a public school teacher, and now as an owner of my own school, I have about 30, 40 animals in my buildings. We have gerbils, hamsters, guinea pigs. I have pet rats. You know, I actually have inspectors that come to my school and actually say, you know, you, everybody's trying to keep the roaches and the rats out. You're actually bringing them into the building. But now when I take out that Madagascar hissing cockroach, every parent's first reaction is that's disgusting. Every child that is two, three, and four, every child that is a young lady, young man, nobody has those fears yet. We instill those fears. We instill those stereotypes. We instill, okay, you could either look at it from let's lay these foundations or let's lay these fears. I am not going to be instilling fears to my children. We incubate our own chicks. I have my own living walls. And the beauty, guys, is Miss Hayat, who was in that video, Miss Khadija, and I have about six other employees who work for me. I have 60 members on my team. Six of them I taught. They are afraid of nothing. And by the way, all six of those employees are beautiful young women today. I taught them all when they were five and six. I could take out any animal, they gravitate towards it. Every other teacher who never had these early life experiences, it takes them so much time to acclimate, okay? And if you go to the next slide, I am almost 50. Um, I can't believe I'm saying that I'm almost 50, but it's true. And I am not a techie, but one thing I realized, even in a preschool level, I have one goal is to give all the kids in my school these early experiences. Now, when you think about all jobs today are in technology, no less tomorrow, we have to lay again these foundations when they're two, three, and four. I brought in so many beautiful technology components into the school where my two-year-olds are coding using a train set from a company called Botsies. My threes are using a really powerful robot 
um, from a company called Sphero. I have a beautiful robot from a company called Kinder Lab Robotics called Kibo. None of these require screens. And my girls in my school, okay, are learning basic computational learning skills and thinking skills. And you're laying these beautiful foundations at the age of two, three, and four, because then by the time they leave me, even if they then go into middle school, and many of these girls don't have a coding robotics experience in elementary school, again, it's about laying foundations with their two and three. And my next page, I'm just really proud of my next page because when I first opened up my school, it was a challenge to try to convince people in the community. And I was so shocked that I actually had to try to convince kids, uh, families in my community that my school isn't a school for boys. My school is a, it, it, my, my school is a school for learners. And we have actually, for the first time, have almost a 100%, okay, if you look at the school from, from 100%, it's literally 50% boys and 50% girls right now. Um, and I've had a lot of amazing people try to convince me to open up. Um, and I know, Amanda, you live, I think you said in Philadelphia, like my dream eventually would be to have these schools globally. I think it's just so important to lay these foundations and start a movement now so that you can break all of these stereotypes, start them when they're two, three, and four. And by the time they're 10 and 11, or they're 15 and 16, or they're 18 and 20, they're always going to have those early life memories, have amazing, how amazing it once was, continue their passion moving forward. Um, and that's it. You know, I'm just kind of talking about a pedagogue's experience. I love what I do. And if you have any questions for me regarding curriculum or thematic units, I'd be happy to speak to any one of you. Reach out to me at my email address that you see there. And thank you so much, guys. It's been a pleasure meeting you all today. Thank you so much to Carmelo, Allison, and Kim for these exciting suggestions, thoughts, um, research, and practice-based tips. We have just a couple more minutes until we're wrapping up our webinar, but I wanted to see if there is any quick questions or comments that people have in the chat that they might want to share. Um, let's see, we have one question. Um, Carmelo, are you thinking of franchising the science preschool idea? Uh, that's a it's an interesting question. A couple years ago, I was very fortunate to meet the owner of Viacom who heard about my schools and my schools are sort of like that. I have four children, but my schools are like my babies and I just didn't, I couldn't sacrifice my babies to yet at that time franchise the model. Um, but the answer there is I think eventually I would love to try to franchise the model because I think it's the only way to really, you know, break those stereotypes is to try to you know, create these schools in, in the inner city, in the suburbs, because it really, and, and again, I think a lot of times, a lot of people have fear, because science means materials, and materials mean money, but, and, you know, but there's a way to teach with very, very cheap, you know, household inexpensive materials to just get your job done. I would love to try to pursue that in my second, I guess, stage of life here, you know, as I get into being almost 50 years old, you know. Awesome. Okay, I have one quick question, probably for Kim. If you could recommend one STEM picture book besides your own, which I already, I'll, I'll help you out there. Besides your own, um, what would be that picture book you recommend out there to parents and early educators? Well, just from the experiences that I've had with the students that I share it with, any of Andrea Beatty's books. Um, she just has such great STEM related books um, with with um, characters that the kids can identify with. Um, and so that would definitely be my go to author for sure. One of my favorites as well. And as I click to the next slide, encouraging you all to share a strategy and approach maybe a picture book that you heard of today that you're going to be sharing with your students or your kids at home. I want to encourage you all to share in the chat what you took away from these three amazing speakers. Um, and if you attended last week, what you took away from the two webinars together in this series and how you will use it to create some change in your community, in your home with one child that you know. I would love to um, to hear about how you're going to take something away from this webinar. And I see that you all are chatting so actively in the chat. You're sharing resources with one another, which is great. We have one resource here that draws on the work of Dr. Allison Master and some of our other speakers on how five simple ways that you can counter STEM stereotypes with children and youth. So please do check that out if you need some help thinking about how you might get started. Um, 
addressing STEM stereotypes. And I see one person said, what she's gonna do next is check out the resources and the studies that were shared in this webinar. Awesome, that's why we have these webinars. Um, thank you again to Kim, Allison, and Carmelo. If you enjoyed our webinar today, please check out some of our upcoming events. Um, we have them here on screen and Nancy has been putting them in the chat. Thank you, Nancy. And please keep in touch with us. You can stay in contact with me directly if you have questions about our national webinar series. My email is here on screen. You can check out our website, ngcproject.org. And what I would love to ask you to do is Nancy's going to pop in a link for our post survey for this webinar, and it also will pop up when I close this Zoom event. I'd love to ask you to take a minute or two to share us your feedback and your thoughts going away from this webinar. Once again, thank you to all of our speakers. Thank you to all of you for sharing and participating in the chat. Our chat will be saved along with a recording of this presentation, as well as the slides, because the researchers and um, educators here today shared so many great things with us. All of that will be sent to you after this webinar. And thank you very much. And I really hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.